Good evening. My name is Liza Gentile and I'm a proud JWU alumna and the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations at Johnson & Wales University. Thank you for joining us for Cook Along with JWU Holiday Baking. We're excited to bring you this program where you can cook along with alum Joshua Livesey, class of 2011, executive pastry chef at Harvest and co-owner of Max by Josh Ganache. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. Please keep your cameras on, but your mics muted. If you have a question for Joshua, please use the raise hand feature located within the participant icon. I will call on you and invite you to turn on your mic and ask your question. You can also type your question into the chat and I will read it aloud to him. The chat feature can be used to message other attendees and is located at the bottom of your screen. I'd now like to introduce our chef, Joshua Livesey. A Rhode Island native, Livesey began his pastry career in his home state at Johnson & Wales University, where he spent four years discovering his passion and honing his craft in all things pastry. After graduating, Livesey worked his way up to head pastry chef at Shelter Harbor Golf Club's fine dining restaurant and held the position of kitchen manager at Sweet Indulgence Bakery in Cranston, Rhode Island. After a stint at Four Seasons Atlanta, Livesey returned to New England to helm the dessert program at Harvard Square's acclaimed Harvest Restaurant, where he has held the title of executive pastry chef since 2016. Livesey is an up and coming powerhouse in Boston's pastry scene, known for innovative desserts featuring delicate details and mouth watering flavor combinations. Livesey gained national recognition for his exquisite talents and creativity on Food Network's Holiday Baking Championship in 2017 and Best Baker in America in 2019, where he finished as a finalist in both nationwide competitions. In an effort to navigate the uncertain times of the pandemic, Joshua and a colleague started a French macaroon business delivering to the greater Boston area. They hope to one day open a shop specializing in all things pastry. When he's not in the kitchen or experimenting with new flavors, Joshua enjoys taking his dogs for a run and spending the afternoon on the beach with his husband and family. Please join me in welcoming Chef Joshua Livesey. Did you hear that? Yes. Okay. All good. We were good? Okay, yeah. sorry. It just prompted me to unmute. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I'm going to walk you through making French macarons right here. Um, for those of you who are baking along, hopefully I'm not going too fast for you. Uh, for those of you who are just enjoying or taking notes, um, as Liza said, if you have any questions as we're going through, feel free to uh, send those along. We'll kind of answer them um, in the moment if it's pertinent to what's going on right there. Um, and then if you have questions, we'll kind of push them to the end um, and feel free to ask anything. Everything's open. Um, so yeah, we're just gonna jump right in. Uh, everyone should have their recipe right here. So we're gonna go off of that. Uh, we're gonna start by making our macaron shells. I'm going to show you that process, um, and then we're going to make an eggnog filling. Uh, so to get started here, we are going to first make an Italian uh, meringue, which consists of egg whites um, that you're going to be adding in a uh, cooked sugar syrup to. <clears throat> so um, before we get to that, if anyone is um, hasn't done this already. I already took my almond flour, which is 250 grams, and my confectioner sugar, and I placed those in a food processor that helps remove any of the clumps um, and kind of mixes all those ingredients really well together. So I have those in a large bowl. I always recommend doing a bowl that's larger than you think you're going to need, because uh, as we fold in our meringue and start getting it mixed, um, you tend to kind of make a mess. So the bigger the bowl, the better. Okay, so moving on to our meringue. Um, we're gonna cook, start our sugar syrup. So I've got my pot right here. I'm adding my 250 grams of granulated sugar. 
go right into the pot. And then I'm adding my 75 grams of water. So usually when I add that, I just kind of go around the edge, hydrating that sugar, and then kind of just the rest right in the center. Okay, so I just use my finger at this point and just kind of go around. You really want all that, all those sugar granules to, um, to hydrate. So get that mix. And then I'm gonna put that right onto the stove on a high heat. Uh, and at this point, if you have a candy thermometer, mine broke, so I don't have that. Um, but you just put that right inside of the pot and then keep an eye on it. Um, I'm gonna be using a digital thermometer, so I'll just kind of periodically be checking it. We're bringing the sugar syrup to 245 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's um, obviously water boils um, much lower than that. So it's gonna get a rolling boil. Um, you actually start to notice, should turn the right burner on, um, that the, the bubbles kind of start to slow down. So when you first start to see the syrup boil, um, the bubbles are gonna be popping and moving very rapidly. And then usually as it gets to about 245, which is the temp we're gonna be pulling it, um, you'll notice that the bubbles kind of start to slow down, get a little more lethargic. Uh, but always use the thermometer. So I'm using a digital probe thermometer. Uh, candy thermometers work great. Um, I don't recommend the uh, infrared for this, just because it does a, a, a surface temperature. So really something that's kind of inserted into the syrup. And then while that's going, um, I'm going to get my um, egg whites started. So I have, um, we measured out egg whites for this two times. So I've got 100 grams right here and then another 100 grams over here. Uh, this 100 grams is going to be turned into a meringue, and then this other one is going to be just added into our almond flour and confectioner sugar mixture um, to get everything hydrated, but this does not need to be turned into a meringue. So we're just going to put this aside for now. Uh, getting my egg whites into my bowl. Uh, anytime. Oh, we're going to this camera. So just adding those in. Uh, anytime that you are making a meringue, uh, just make sure that you go, before you get started, um, clean your bowl and your whip attachment. We're using the whip attachment for this. Um, just clean them really well with hot soapy water. Any fat residue that's left on those um, is going to interfere with the, the meringue reaching its, its full volume. There are other tricks that like wiping them with vinegar beforehand. I, I don't run into any issues um, as long as I'm just using hot soapy water and just wash it really well before you get started. Especially if your KitchenAid mixer like mine has been sitting in a cabinet for the past year and was full of dust. Okay, so I have those in there and we're just gonna get this mixing. Um, I'm gonna talk really loud because this mixer's a little loud. I get it onto like a speed, like a medium low. I think I have it like a three right now. Uh, we're just trying to get those egg whites kind of broken up. We really want them to start foaming a little bit. And then we're gonna pour in our sugar syrup. Um, once it has reached the 245 degrees Fahrenheit, like I mentioned earlier. So at this point, uh, my syrup is just starting to boil. Um, so it's gonna take a few more minutes to kind of get that going. My egg whites are mixing. Um, and then I'm gonna add a little bit of color. So I'm using, I think I have listed in the ingredients. Uh, this is the brand that I use for all my, my macarons. Um, you can order directly from their website. Anyone can, they get, get shipped to you. Uh, it's just like a powdered color. Uh, it doesn't really interfere. Um, sometimes when you're using like a liquid to uh, color your shells, uh, sometimes that liquid can kind of interfere with your ratios, uh, especially if you're doing like a red and you have like a liquid color. It takes so much liquid color to get to where you need to be. Uh, this is what I recommend if you're doing a lot. If you just have food colorings, just kind of like the basic that you buy at the grocery store, those work as well. I just wouldn't overdo it with the amount of uh, color that you're adding in. Sorry, just checking on myself. Uh, because it, that, that moisture is going to interfere. 
So I'm just going to take, if you're using this product, it takes like the tiniest amount. Um, and I add those, I add that right into my meringue. Uh, so it can fully hydrate. I find that if you're using this product and you're going into, um, say you're like mixing it in kind of last minute, there's certain colors that don't fully incorporate. So if you're using this, add it to your uh, meringue and then it will fully hydrate. Okay, so I'm at like 235 with my syrup right now, so I'm very close. You don't want to walk away from something like this because it, um, it'll go very rapidly, especially if you have it on a uh, high heat. Uh, if anyone has any questions, now's a good time to kind of jump in. If you have questions about anything as this is kind of coming up to town. We have one question. Okay. Uh, can, you use, can you use a gel food coloring? Uh, you can use a gel food coloring. That's um, if you don't have the powder. That's what I would recommend, uh, just because that's going to bring in less moisture than um, a liquid one. So yes, the gel one would work. Uh, but if you're using liquid and gel, you could have those right as you're kind of mixing by hand. Uh, those don't need to be added in advance. Okay, if we want to switch to the close-up camera, I'm going to start streaming in my uh, sugar syrup. Okay, so this sugar syrup is 245 degrees, which is pretty hot. So you're going to want to stream this down. You're going to, I'm going to turn my mixer on high, and I'm going to stream it down the side. Uh, if you try to pour it in the middle, the whip attachment is going to just fling that sugar like all over the place, um, and that's not what you want. You want it to kind of stream down the side, and then the, the whip attachment will, will pick it up. So I'm going really slow as this is going in. You don't want to overdo it. Okay, so now that all my, um, my sugar syrup has been added uh, to my whipping whites, I'm gonna turn it down to uh, speed eight and just kind of let it do its thing for a little while. Um, yeah, this should be good. Okay. Okay, so hmm. my screen just went blank. Is it just on my end or are we 
I think it's just on your end. Okay, cool. So I'll just carry on. Uh, I might just have a loose connection. Um, okay, so I've got my pre um, uh, food process almond flour confectioner sugar in my bowl right here. And I've got my second addition of the 100 grams of egg whites that's not being turned into a meringue. We're just going to go ahead and we're going to add those egg whites right into the uh, almond flour and confectioner sugar. And I'm just going to start mixing this. Really just trying to hydrate all that uh, confectioner sugar and almond flour. It's going to turn this into like a really stiff uh, paste. And then once that's uh, mixed and our meringue's good, we're going to start folding our meringue into this thing. We do have one other question. Yeah, let's go. So almond flour I know is traditional, but if someone has an allergy, is there another flour that they can use or can we only make these with almond flour? Yeah. So, um, yeah, if you have specifically an almond allergy uh, and want to sub in a different kind of nut flour, uh, you can. You're going to run into maybe a few issues with the um, with the fat content. Almonds aren't super fatty. Uh, if you go with a nut that has a lot more fat in it, uh, you'll just probably end up with a, a greasier cookie. Um, if you are allergic to nuts, I would recommend a different cookie. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, they're just, you know, the way that this recipe is designed, um, you really need to be using a nut flour in it. So if there's a nut allergy, you really should just kind of find a different cookie in it. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sure there are different ways that people have made them. With different flowers. Uh, I personally do not have any experience using them. Um, I have heard of people, uh, like with the, if you have an egg allergy, making a meringue um, using the liquid from like a can of chickpeas called aquafaba. Uh, I've actually made meringue with it before. My mom has a severe egg allergy, and I have uh, I made her a lemon meringue pie using um, aquafaba. And it's actually really it's really freaky because it's so it's almost exactly like meringue. Uh, there's no eggs in it, and it's just the water of that like chickpeas that I'm sitting in. It's strange, but um, I have not made them. I've not used the meringue to make. Uh, Macarons before, but I have seen people use that. Okay, so we're gonna check on our egg whites now. I'm gonna see what our meringue is looking like. Okay, yes. I'm gonna get rid of this mixer. Some more room. Okay, so I have my meringue here, and you can see that I've got uh, stiff peaks. So you're putting your whip inside your bowl, slowly pulling it out, and then flipping it over. So if you can see the um, the meringue is pretty much standing straight up. It's got a little bit of fold just from that little piece. Um, if it's completely falling. Um, or um, it's definitely folding off a little bit more. Sometimes it's like super runny. That means that your meringue is either with one, it's not uh, whipped enough and needs to keep going, or two, um, you have messed up your meringue. <laughs> Where uh, issues like that could happen if you didn't fully separate your eggs well enough and there's 
um, little pieces of yolk that were mixed in and that fat is interfering with the meringue holding its shape. Um, if at this point you are just liquid, um, you, you're better off starting this over. Um, at this point, what's in here is 100 grams of whites and a little bit of sugar. Uh, so you're not losing as much at this point as if you were to just push through and try to make the, the macarons and then they don't turn out well. Uh, so if you are not able to get your meringue to this point, um, I recommend trying to start over so that you're not ruining. So I just went with like a really light, like wintry blue with this one. Okay. So you can see that I've got my, um, my almond flour and confectioner sugar mixed with my egg whites. And we've got this like pretty firm paste going on right here. And the next step is to fold my meringue in. And we're gonna do this in stages. We're not gonna throw all of this in at once. You'll never, um, it's just gonna be a pain to like mix it. You've got like these very two different consistencies. This one is very firm. If you're trying to add in your meringue too rapidly, it's not gonna, it's not gonna incorporate. So I usually just take a little amount like this, add it in. We're just gonna start folding. So this part right here is um, one of the most crucial steps in making macarons um, and something that just kind of takes practice of knowing exactly when you've mixed enough or if you've over mixed. Um, and yeah, and that just, uh, people always ask like, how do you, how do you know for sure? Uh, the best way is just to practice it. I mean, usually the first time you make macarons, they don't turn out well. Um, sometimes the 100th time you've made macarons, they do not turn out well. Um, yeah. Just more practice, better. So you can see now that's fully incorporated. Going on to the next addition. You can go a little bit more this time because we have loosened up that, um, that mixture. Just continuing to fold here. So typically when you have um, a meringue that you're adding to any sort of mixture, uh, whether that's like a mousse or you're making a cake that's leavened with uh, a meringue, you usually want to be very gentle with it because you're not wanting to deflate that um, the air that's trapped in the meringue. Uh, this is a very different situation. We're actually going to try to knock out a lot of the air once we are fully incorporated. So continuing to fold. Um, now, now is a really good time to kind of really get to know your batter here and really see how um, how much it's going to change from at this stage where we've added all of our meringue in, but we haven't quite um, mixed it enough. Um, so if you can see, oops, let me try to do that so you can see it. Kind of like very slowly falling off the spatula and it's kind of just plopping into the bowl. It's holding its shape. Um, you can also look at the kind of the shine in it. Um, it has a little bit of a shine now, but it will have more of a shine once we've reached the, um, the stage that we are looking for here. Um, so at this point, you kind of need to be aggressive. You're like really kind of smashing it against the side of the bowl, mixing it, you're really scraping the bottom of the bowl, folding it over. And then you're constantly checking on it. You're looking at how, how is it falling? So you can see now it's kind of streaming off the spatula a little bit more than it was when I first started folding it. That means it's getting closer to the stage we need it to be in. But if you see it in the bowl, it's still kind of holding those clumps in the center, um, which means we have a little more to go. You want that to kind of smooth out as it's sitting there. Uh, this is going to give you those, uh, the macarons that have like a really smooth top if you're having issues with um, them being really bumpy on top um, or really being um, like really tall. Uh, when they come out, it means you just haven't uh, knocked enough air out yet. 
So any questions on this stage so far? No questions yet. All right. But while you mixed, would you like to tell us a little bit about your experience on Food Network? Oh yeah, sure. Um, so I was on two different um, competition shows. Uh, one was the Holiday Baking Championship. That was the first one that I did, uh, which still like runs just, I think it was on last, last night maybe. There's reruns that play, uh, that go all throughout the season, which is fun. Um, and then the second show I did was Best Baker in America. Uh, I really, really enjoyed the first one that I did. Um, but what I liked about the second one was I felt like it was a better showcase of kind of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis um, and kind of what I'm capable of. The holiday baking, though really fun, was kind of geared a little bit more towards like the home baker. And I felt like it could show off a little bit more with the uh, with the best baker one. But the holiday baking one was really fun. Like the people that I met there, like that filmed over, that filmed like three and a half years ago. And I, I still keep in touch with the people from the, um, um, from the show, like the other cast members. Some of them came to my wedding, which was really cool. Okay, so now we're pretty much getting to like the stage that we're looking for. Um, it's really just running off this spatula really nicely. Um, and then it's smoothing out in the bowl. It's not quite holding that, um, those chunks as, as much. We do have one more question. Yeah. Can you use 100% of the egg whites every time? Yes. Yeah, everything that I do um, for this recipe is very precise and you want to use, um, you want to use those measurements exactly, which is why I do everything in weight and not in, um, by volume. I just feel like there's too much room for error in volume and you're much more exact. Um, you can see I even use grams because I think, well, I know grams are more accurate than doing it in ounces. Um, so that's why I use grams in pretty much all the recipes I use. Uh, when you get into things like if you see in the, the ganache, I use um, volume for like the salt and the, um, the nutmeg, just because those are such minuscule amounts, unless you specifically have like a gram scale that you would use for like drugs, um, you're not really going to get anything super accurate. And, and it's just easier to do that for that. Um, but when you are making this recipe, yes, you want to use all the ingredients. Um, luckily, we're in winter. Um, hold on one second. My dog is going crazy. I'm just going to let her out of the room. Sorry about that. I'm back. Um, talking about grants. Yeah, so everything... Um, use it exactly. We're in winter right now, which is like ideal, especially, I mean, in New England, it's a lot drier right now, which is super ideal for making macarons. Uh, when we started our macaron business, I was doing them out of my house and it was summertime. Um, I was having to like set up a dehumidifier and it was just like, it was too much. Um, but what's really nice about doing them in the winter is that they set really quickly. Um, Cause what we're gonna, you'll see is that once we pipe these and kind of get them tapped out um, before you bake them, you want them to dry on the top. Um, and basically you're gonna to be touching the tops, top of these cookies. Um, and as long as your finger is not kind of sticking to the top of them, then they're ready to bake. But if you try doing that in very humid weather, um, they just take a really long time um, to set. And I find that the meringue um, starts to like lose its stability. So I've done stuff before where I've kind of subbed in um, uh, a little bit of cornstarch to kind of help um, dry them out a little bit quicker, but that's not necessary um, in the winter right now. Okay, so now we're going to um, pipe the macarons. 
So I am using, you definitely want a piping bag. Um, I am using an Ateco 805 tip. Um, hmm, little smaller than a dime. Um, round tip to be piping down. If you don't have piping tips and you're just using a piping bag and you're just cutting a hole, that works too. Uh, you're just not going to get quite, I guess we could kind of zoom in here. Um, you're not going to get quite the same. Um, you're just not, they're not going to be consistent and perfectly round. So it helps to have that um, when you're piping. Uh, I always put my piping bags. So you want to cut the tip of your piping bag and then you drop your tip in. Uh, and then I do, um, I twist and then I kind of push the bag in from, um, from the inside. And then that's going to keep it closed for us so that you, when you pick it up, it's not like batter, it's just like pouring out of the rest. So I always kind of do that. Um, I've got a container here. This way you can just put it in and then it makes it really easy to fill. So I'm just going through with my batter here. I always recommend don't overfill your bag. Um, maybe halfway, especially if you're just kind of learning how to use a piping bag. Um, it can get out of control really quick. The, um, the batter can kind of pour out the back of the bag um, really easily and make a mess. Okay. Um, so I've got it in my bag here. I am a lefty, so I always um, hold the top of the bag with my uh, left hand, and that's going to be using the pressure, and then my right hand is going to be guiding. Uh, I twist the top of the bag. Uh, this will keep it from going out this direction, which is not what you want. And then I'm positioning it between my thumb and kind of my um, the base of my uh, index finger there. And then I'm going to keep that pinched, and that'll keep that uh, bag twisted and everything flowing in the direction that we want to. And then you're just going to grasp it with this hand. And then once you're ready to go, you just, you saw I just kind of untwisted it. Oh, sorry, let me talk about um, what I'm piping on before I get started here. So I use uh, like food grade Teflon sheets. I just got these on the internet. They're really cheap. Um, and like nothing sticks to them. You can also do um, sill pats as well. Those are definitely a little bit more expensive. Um, I think I got a roll of these. They were twice the size, I cut them in half. I think it was a, a pack of eight maybe for like 10 bucks when sill pats, like half sill pats can run you like $20 a piece. Um, so this is a little bit more affordable and this is what I used to make all the time too. They don't last as long, but as long as you take care of them, they'll do just fine. So when I'm done, I just wipe them um, with like a soapy damp cloth to clean them, let them dry, uh, and then I just store them kind of rolled up. Okay, going into piping. So you're just piping, and then you're stopping the pipe, and then swirling it off. And I'm spacing mine enough because um, you need that air to kind of circulate through them as you're going, as they're being baked, I'm sorry. So a few tricks to kind of keeping them the same size. Um, some people will like count as they're doing them. So if you're like one, two, one, two, and then that helps kind of keep you like consistently sized. Um, also, something to remember is we're going to tap these out um, to release air, air bubbles that are in them, uh, and they're going to spread a little bit. So you want to go a little smaller than um, the desired like end result there. Just going through. Squeeze a few more on there. 
And then um, I hold the, the um, Teflon sheets down because they are lighter than Silpats, but I just kind of hold that down with my fingers. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna tap them on this whole sheet pan onto the counter. That's gonna cause the uh, macarons to uh, flatten out. And they're also gonna release any air pockets so that you get like really smooth tops. So, a little loud. Then I kind of turn it this way, tap it here. And you're really giving it like a good solid um, smack on it. Then we can see that they're really nice and smooth on the top. Um, they're nice and shiny. Okay, so something we're gonna look for right now because they're, they haven't gone in the oven yet. Um, if you touch them, see how it's sticking to my finger? Okay. When they're ready to bake, they won't do that. So we'll go through and do another test so you can see that. Maybe. I don't, I don't know if they'll dry in time um, before this video is over. Sometimes they take longer than other times. Uh, but I'll, what you're looking for essentially is like just very gently just touching your finger on the top. And if it's formed like a crust on top, that's what we're looking for. Sounds a little weird. But what's essentially what's going to happen is because the top of that cookie has dried out, when it goes into the oven, instead of um, the, uh, the, the, the batter is going to expand, right? So if the, the um, skin has not formed on top of these cookies, they're going to crack. They're just going to expand and just open up. Um, if you've created that nice shell on top, they're just going to essentially just lift straight up. Um, and then the batter will kind of push out the base of these in the bottom and give you like little feet. Um, and then when you take them out, they'll kind of settle a little bit and you'll have this nice smooth top um, and kind of a little more craggy edge. And then ideally it's got like a nice kind of crispy exterior but nice gooey center, which is ideal for macarons. Okay, so I'm gonna let those hang out for a little bit. Um, and then we're gonna make our filling. Okay, so traditionally in um, kind of the two main fillings that you see in macarons um, are either like a buttercream or a ganache. Uh, I prefer a ganache, but I, I mean, I think buttercream works in certain applications, but for me personally, I like the mouthfeel of ganache over buttercream in a macaron. Uh, so we're gonna be making a ganache today. Uh, and then this is where the flavor uh, comes in for a macaron, the shells typically don't have any flavor other than the almond uh, from the almond flour. And then you get to really have fun with uh, the different fillings that you use. So we're going with an eggnog filling for today. Um, so we're using, uh, to kind of give it that like eggnog feel, um, we're using rum and nutmeg, and I'm using a little bit of vanilla as well. Um, and then eggnog is like very rich and creamy. So we've got the heavy cream and the white chocolate in there that are going to um, kind of help balance that out. So what we're gonna do, uh, it's just a very simple, straightforward ganache here. Um, we're gonna take our heavy cream. So this recipe says to heat the cream and the rum just to a simmer. Uh, if you want a little bit of that kind of the booziness cooked out, then you can do that. Um, if you want to leave in as much booze as possible, add the rum once you take the cream off, which is what I'm going to be doing. So heavy cream is going into this pot. I'm just going to bring it to a simmer on the stove. Any more questions about macarons, shells, process, mixing? We have a couple questions. Oh, yeah, me. One um, from Haley. She'd like to know, what's your favorite thing to bake? Oh, my favorite thing to bake. Um, I get this question all the time and I haven't come up with an answer yet, which is really 
should spend some time thinking about that. <laughs> uh, all right, so I get bored really easy, which is why I work in a kitchen. Um, so I like making everything. I liked it, the fact that my job allows me to do a little bit of everything. So we, uh, at, I work at, my main job is the executive pastry chef at Harvest Restaurant. And there we have a bread program. Uh, so we make all of our bread for both lunch and dinner service. We make our lobster rolls, we make our burger buns. Um, we, when I was fully staffed before the pandemic hit, uh, we were also making uh, our own sourdough bread. We make our own English muffins for brunch. Uh, I was doing a little bit of laminated dough for brunch as well. Uh, and then we also do desserts. So plated desserts for both lunch and dinner. And then every once in a while we have um, weddings or celebrations where I get to make cake. So I like the fact that I can do a bunch of different stuff. I know that doesn't really answer your question, but hopefully it does. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Um, one more, why do gaps form after you bake the shells? Um, so there are a few, um, I'm guessing the gap being uh, between the top shell and then the batter and it's really kind of hollow in the cookie, which is very common. Um, few reasons for that. One is if your meringue isn't um, strong enough. So when I showed you the meringue being the stiff peaks, um, if you don't take it far enough and it's not, doesn't have that kind of stability, um, which you can also lose from um, over mixing. What's tough about macarons is there's, there's a lot of little factors in there. Um, I have noticed issues with mine being hollow when it was more humid out um, because they had to sit for too long. And I think it had to do with like the meringue being too weak. I don't often bake them in a home oven. I'm going to show you how we bake, I bake at home. Um, a kind of a trick that seemed to work for me. I tried out a few different things. Um, yeah, just trial and error. Because there's a there's a there's a bunch of different reasons that that could be happening. Um, look online and just I recommend if you're going to be changing some variables, just to do one at a time. So you change four things and you're like, oh, not sure which one was the one that did it. Uh, is my recommendation. Okay, so I am putting uh, my chocolate in the bowl here. My cream just came to a simmer. For people that are baking along at home, should they be preheating their ovens at this um, point? Yeah, yeah, because it's winter and they dry really quick. Yes, I was just about to say that. So let's preheat our ovens, home ovens to 300. I make a 270 at work, but that's a commercial oven. Um, sorry. Okay, so I've got my, my heavy cream right here. I'm adding in, uh, I already pre-mixed my rum with my vanilla bean and my nutmeg and my salt. So that can just go right in with your cream, which now I can really smell the nutmeg and the rum. That's really good. And I'm just gonna pour that right over my chocolate. Okay, so options. You can also do this in a food processor. Um, I'm just doing it in a bowl because there are, was already too many noisy things going on. Uh, but yes, yeah, so you can throw this all into a food processor. I always let it sit for a few minutes to allow that cream to kind of melt the uh, chocolate. We have another question about the shells. Okay. When we're doing the egg whites and also with the meringues too. Can you use meringue powder instead of egg whites? Uh, yes, I have seen recipes for that as well. Um, I prefer fresh ingredients. So that's why I use fresh whites. Um, and I have, I don't think I've ever done them with 
meringue powder. But you can, yeah. You just would have to find a different recipe because I don't know the exact um, conversion. And we have one other question. What was your favorite class when you were a student at Johnson and Wales? <laughs> this, this isn't a trick question. There's not like a professor watching, is there? No professors watching. Okay, good. Um, what was my favorite class? Oh, it's been a minute. Um, I really enjoyed, <laughs> there were a few different classes I had. I like, even though I'm like not a cake, I mean, I've done cakes before and I enjoy doing cakes and it's like a fun creative outlet. I had a lot of fun in those class, in my cakes classes. Um, but I think like plated desserts was probably one of my favorite. I think that really opened my eyes to kind of what I'm doing right now um, in the sense of like really learning about uh, different flavor combinations and what worked well together. I think I had a lot of the creative outlet was not only the visual aspect, which is what originally drew me to pastry, uh, but the creative of like combining flavors uh, and really getting things to like taste good together and textures to really work, which you kind of lost in like the cakes classes where they were kind of preset recipes. Um, but with the plated desserts, it was like a little bit more freedom. So I enjoyed that. So that's probably, that's probably my favorite. But I loved all my professors at Johnson Wells. They were all really great. All right, so my kitchen's a little I had this chocolate in my car and it was very cold. So I'm just gonna put this over uh, a, a double boiler. You shouldn't have this problem um, if you're using a food processor, uh, but I just have a double boiler going, um, which is just a pot with some water. And then I'm just gonna put my bowl of um, ganache on top just to heat it up a little more to get it. Get that chocolate to fully melt and emulsify. Um, with this ganache, it's, um, the ratio of liquids to chocolate is much lower so that you have like a nice firm ganache um, so that when they're at room temperature, they're not just melting and um, oozing everywhere that they actually kind of hold their, um, hold their shape. So I had that going. And Michael would like to know if you can show us the piped tray again so they can see how far apart they are. Okay. I definitely did this on purpose. We move into the closer cam. Um, I wanted to show you both. This is how you should do that. This is too close. So this one, I don't know, it's good. Two inches, an inch and a half apart, two inches. Um, so down here, and then I have them offset. So when you're um, in a, Um, a conventional oven, you don't have the air circulating as much, so you really need to give them space to kind of the heat to really get to everybody evenly. Uh, so it's important when you're making fillings to go through and, I mean, anytime you're cooking or baking to taste what you're making as you go. Uh, this is something that we can kind of adjust flavors. Um, if we don't think there's enough nutmeg, you can add more. Uh, if you don't think there's enough rum, that's a little 
tough to add more to, uh, but you could add a little bit more salt, or if you think it needs more vanilla in there, you could eat that. So we got this going. Yeah, so I'm kind of getting some um, eggnoggy ness to it, even though it doesn't have like the egg yolks that like a traditional eggnog would have. It does have that kind of like rich creaminess that you're getting from the chocolate that you're getting from the heavy cream. We have another question about baking the shells. If you have a convection oven, is it better to use that feature? Yes. Oh boy. Um, yeah, so I use a convection oven at work. I don't know. So when I bake at work with a convection oven, I bake at 270 for nine minutes. Nine, sorry, nine and a half minutes. And then that was really nice. So basically um, you're opening the oven at nine and a half minutes um, and you're kind of touching the top of one of them and it should jiggle a little bit, but not like slide off of its base when you kind of move it. Um, my advice would be to bake one tray at a time and kind of really let it cool down and then eat it and then kind of adjust your time because every every oven's different. Um, like even if I went to another professional kitchen, I would test the oven first because everyone's oven is like a little bit different and because these are such a delicate cookie, um, you really just kind of need to know your oven. So I would try that. Try convection oven on 270, nine and a half minutes, and then let them cool completely and try one. It should have like a nice, um, just kind of thin crunch on the outside and then not be raw in the center, um, but definitely like really soft and a little bit chewy. Uh, if it's like biting into it and the thing like turns to dust or it's like really hard to bite into you've gone too long um if you have like almost raw batter in the center obviously you've gone too short and you just kind of adjust as you see time with practice okay so my ganache is um ready it's obviously not ready to pipe uh, because it's this loose right here um ideally you want to be kind of using your ganaches at um, roughly 95 degrees. So if you still have, if you have like a probe thermometer, um, you can kind of get in here uh, to do that. Yeah, so I'm hovering at like 105, 104. Yeah, so this is definitely too, too loose being this warm. Uh, so I'll just have to let this kind of sit and, and firm up a little more before I start piping it. Um, but if you are um, making your cookies all the way through, once they kind of dry and they bake and they cool, your ganache should be um, should be ready to go. If you need to, um, if it becomes too firm and it's set too much and you need to kind of get it back to the pipeable consistency around 95 degrees, um, there's two options. You can either do it in the microwave, just in like really small, like quick uh, amounts. I do recommend having a thermometer so you can kind of be temping it uh, because it can go from 90 degrees to 105 degrees in a matter of like six or seven seconds in the microwave. So just kind of keep an eye on it. Um, you can also kind of do the double boiler um, option that I had. Just keep an eye on it, not letting it go too far above. And if it does, just let it cool for a little bit to allow it to set. So my max aren't quite there yet, unfortunately. Um, and since we're probably not gonna, oh yeah, we're gonna this one. Sit here all night. Um, as you can see, as I'm touching them, they're still tacky. They shouldn't do that when you lightly touch them. So just need to leave them a little bit longer. But like I said, it depends on the humidity in your um, in your kitchen. Um, those should be ready probably, I would say, in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, they go really fast at work because we have like a hood system that kind of like moves the air and dries them really quickly. 
um, but in usually in a home oven. And we'll go over the baking process. So I'm baking um, at home 300 degrees um, for 18 minutes. Um, and I leave the oven door cracked. This worked for me. There's like a hundred ways that you can make macarons and you'll find every option on the internet. Uh, but this one seemed to work for me. If it doesn't work for you, I recommend trying different options. So I just take like a wooden spoon and I just kind of like wedge it um, kind of in the oven door. And so it's cracked open a little bit and it works for me. Um, it was just kind of a technique that I found that someone used and that really worked for me. Um, and then 18 minutes is kind of like also the time that worked for my oven. Um, I have, I just moved into my house here, so I haven't used this oven, so it may be different. Uh, but like I said, just kind of try to do a few trials um, to get like the best results. Um, they're a very challenging cookie to do. Um, usually you don't get them on your first try, um, but keep practicing. And they usually, I mean, anytime I've had a failure with these, they still taste good. Uh, you can still eat them, obviously, don't throw them away. Um, but if you're really trying to achieve kind of that like perfect consistency, perfect shape, it really just comes with putting it over and over and over and practicing it. Um, so these are, uh, so I started a macaron business with a colleague of mine. And we started this in back in June. Uh, so we kind of, through the seasons have been updating our flavors. Uh, we currently operate in the Boston area um, doing deliveries. So in the summer, we rolled out two different sets of flavors. And then for fall, we had some really fun flavors and just, uh, just after Thanksgiving launched our Christmas flavors, uh, which currently has the, uh, the spiked eggnog is one of them. Um, and what I, I find what's really fun about my friends is that you can do like a lot of different flavors. We currently have a, a candy cat mushroom one, uh, which is really fun explaining to people because no one wants um, a mushroom flavored macaron when they just hear that. So um, we kind of have to explain that it's really awesome flavor. It's kind of this mixture of maple meets butterscotch. And it's so funny because all the people who are like hesitant about it always reach out to us after and they're like, that was my favorite one. So it's really cool to kind of be able to give that people that experience of like trying something new that they weren't going to, going to try on their own that we kind of like forced upon them. Uh, and then I'm really enjoying it afterwards, which is cool. Um, so yeah, so once your macarons come out and they've cooled, um, what I recommend you doing is there, there's never going to be a time when they're all the exact same size. Um, but you want the two that you kind of match up to make a sandwich, your sandwich, um, to be the same size. So usually what I do is I kind of pick up the two shells and then match them up. If they match, good. If not, find a new one and kind of get them matched up. And then I line them all up. Um, so like what's going to be the top is top up and what's going to be the bottom is going to be um, kind of the inside up and just line them up. And then that way you can go through and kind of fill them all um, assembly line style and get them all done, cap them. If your ganache is still a little bit um, loose and you want them to fully set, I would put them in the fridge just for a few minutes so that that ganache um, fully set if it's really loose. If not, just leave it at room temp and it'll set. Um, if you're looking to get ahead on them, you can definitely throw them in the freezer. Um, so get them fully assembled, get the filling, um, filling in, sandwich them, uh, and then get them in the freezer and wrap them really well. Um, and it'll last a few weeks in the freezer and be really good. Just thaw them completely before you pull them out. So if you want to get ahead for Christmas or something like that, I would avoid putting them in the fridge. Uh, there tends to be a lot of moisture in the fridge and they just get super soft. Um, so freezer to room temp. We have one last question for you. All right. The ones that are in the box that are very white, how did you get them that white? Oh, uh, uh, chemicals. <laughs> we just have a white, a white food coloring. It's called titanium dioxide, I believe. Um, jury's still out on how much of that you should be consuming, but we just put a little bit in there just to give it like a pop of white. It also really helps that they are surrounded by other ones that have, um, color in them to kind of make them a little bit more bright white. But it was funny, we were making the gold ones today 
and we don't put any color in those. And those came out of the oven almost as white as the um, um, the ones with the white coloring in them. But yeah, they do have white white coloring for macarons. And would you need to adapt the recipe for a high altitude? I live at sea level. I am not sure. Oh, that's a good question. I lived in Colorado for, I did like an internship when I was at school in Colorado, but we didn't make macarons. Okay. I don't know. I'm sorry. Ooh. But the internet would know if you Googled that. Would we have people from a high altitude joining us? Or just curious? It seems like it's, she said, about 9,500 feet above sea level. Okay, that's a little more than me. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I do not have the answer to that. Um, but the internet would. Give it to Google. Great. And then are you able to fill one of the macarons? No, 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 no. I was, is the ganache too hot still? The ganache is still too warm. And I was at work today and I was like packaging everything up. And I forgot to bring um, empty shells with me and it was on my list. And I even tried like removing the filling from one of these so that I could show you filling one because I brought some already set ganache with me. Um, and then the cookies were just falling apart. So I'm so sorry um, about filling for those. No problem. Would they, can you explain to them how they would? Yeah, like so I, I have the same, um, I have it set up because I was going to do it. Yeah, so for the ganache, um, you kind of have two options. So this is a firmer ganache. So if you're piping at the right um, temperature, you want to go to this camera over here. I just use like a really small um, star tip. And if you can see, oh, that's tough to tell on some of these. Um, actually, you can see on the right one. So the star tip gives you like a little bit more texture kind of when you're piping it, that I think just looks like a little bit more fun. Uh, you could also just do no tip or a round tip when you're piping, uh, but I do the same setup, put it into a bag, um, put the tip in, do the whole twist and push, get into a container. And honestly, if you've taken away nothing from this class except for this, you're already a step ahead because that really does help. Because trying to like hold it in one hand while you're like picking it up is like too much. So if you have it here, you're good to go. Um, yeah, and then just right into your bag. Same same technique that you were doing the um, the other ones where you hold your bag um, kind of in this hand, and then you're guiding with the other hand. Um, do a few and like put the lids on. Um, you need less than you think you do. Um, so don't, don't overdo it when you're putting the filling in. Uh, so do a few, put the caps on, see how they look um, before you kind of do them all and realize you either put too much or too little uh, when you're piping that in. Uh, Buttercream is obviously much easier to pipe, easier to work with than a ganache because it's not so temperature sensitive. Um, but that's the same deal, piping bag, just go through. Uh, some people get really creative and they do like um, we've done it as well. We do like a buttercream ring around the outside and you can fill it with like a jam or something in the center. So we invite it to kind of get two different um, kind of textures. Yeah, this is still. Great. Well, yeah. that was helpful. Cool. Thank cool. You. Glad it was. <laughs> and now I would like to introduce um, Lori Zabata, our Director of Alumni Relations, to close us out today. Thanks, Liza. Thank you, Joshua, for such an amazing demo. You certainly got us in the holiday spirit. We're grateful to you for sharing your time with us and appreciate all that you've taught us tonight. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the alumni relations team for their help behind the scenes, especially Liza Gentile for her work to bring this great program to us. Finally, thank you to all of our alumni attendees for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this program this evening. Joshua is an amazing example of the world-class education our students receive at the College of Food Innovation and Technology, or CFET. You can help support tomorrow's culinary leaders today with a donation to support CFET, but your gift is more than a donation. The simple act of giving any amount actually contributes to the growth of JWU's reputation, our rankings and ratings. You can boost JWU's standing by giving each and every year to the university, which increases the value of your own degree and makes alumni even more sought after by employers. 
Thanks to a generous donation from trustee and parent David, Dave Wilson, all gifts will be matched up to $100,000 until December 31st. So if you're in a position to help us meet that challenge, I ask that you consider to do so. That is the power of collective giving. We've included a link in the chat for your convenience. And on behalf of our students, I thank you for your generosity. We sincerely hope that you enjoyed this session, Cook Along with JWU Holiday Baking, part of the JWU for You family of programming. Through JWU for You, alumni can engage in informative and interesting discussions related to personal development, social and avid interest topics. For the full listing of upcoming events, please visit our event calendar at alumni.jwu.edu. Thank you again for your attendance. I wish you all a healthy and happy holiday season. And we look forward to seeing you in the very new year. Cheers to 2021.